Since the dawn of civilization, the forces of nature and the whims of gods held sway over humanity. But two and a half thousand years ago, humankind experienced a profound transformation. Suddenly, there were new possibilities. This is a time when rationality overrode superstition and belief. This is an ethic which does not rely on the gods. The world is now explained in terms of natural forces. We are now responsible for our own destiny. Upheavals across the globe sparked an ambitious vision of what humans could achieve, spearheaded by three trailblazers. Socrates, Confucius and the Buddha great thinkers from the ancient world whose ideas still shape our own lives. Is wealth a good thing? How do you create a just society? How do I live a good life? By daring to think the unthinkable, they laid the foundations of our modern world. I've always been intrigued by the fact that these men who lived many thousands of miles apart, seemed almost spontaneously, within a hundred years of one another, to come up with such radical ways of thinking. So what was going on? I want to investigate their revolutionary ideas, to understand what set them in motion. In this program, I'm on the trail of that quintessential Eastern sage, Confucius. He had a mission, but many people at that time did not agree with him. His vision was modeled on the power of the past and the family. He believed that education could transform both individuals and society. He's talking about your state of mind, your feelings. But in the 20th century, Confucius was declared an enemy of communism. So now he should be out of favor but that hardly seems to be the case. This is the longest continuous civilization in the world, and Confucius has a huge role in that. It's so amazing to be so close to them. My heart is beating. In 551 BC, an elderly ex-soldier from the ancient state of Lu faced a grave predicament. His family line was in danger of ending. He needed a son to continue his name, someone who'd be able to perform the vital rituals to honor him and his ancestors. The old man took a young wife. We're told that she went to a sacred mountain and prayed hard for a boy. The son she bore would become known as Master Kong. In Chinese, Kong Fuzhe. In the West, we call him Confucius. Confucius was born into one of the most advanced civilizations in the world. The ancient Chinese were innovators in art, metalwork, agriculture, and weaponry. And from around 1000 BC, they developed a sophisticated political system, a network of vassal lords who bore allegiance to one king. But by the time Confucius was growing up, stability had turned to chaos. This was an age when all of ancient China was trapped in a ruthless cycle of war.
tribal invasions from the west, along with rebellion amongst the lords, splintered the empire into independent states. All vying for power. Spurred on by a kind of arms race, now that cast iron meant that weapons could be mass produced, families attacked families. This was total war. This collapse in society would become the catalyst for Confucius's groundbreaking philosophy. The oldest record of Confucius' life and ideas, the Analects, were compiled about a century after his death. These fragments of his conversations, along with other later histories, give us clues to his life story. We're told that Confucius was just three when his father died. Old aristocracy, he'd fallen on hard times, one of the victims of the turmoil of the age, leaving Confucius's mother to raise her son on her own in a kind of genteel poverty. Interestingly, it seems that education was Confucius's lifeline. Somehow, probably through a mix of private teachers and homeschooling, and you suspect the sheer grit and determination of his mother, Confucius was taught history, poetry, and ritual. While other children played with toys, he said to have acted out sacred rituals by laying out cups and bowls. Now, these weren't just empty gestures, a bit of spiritual theater. The kinds of rituals that Confucius learned played a crucial role in the ancient Chinese worldview. A worldview in which order and harmony, both on Earth and in the cosmos, were considered essential goals if life on Earth was to continue. The ancient rites that young Confucius knew were performed here at the Temple of Heaven in Beijing right up until the 20th century. The Chinese had a particular religious outlook, which meant that these rituals weren't directed towards a deity. There is no creator god. There's nothing like the idea of a supreme power that dreams everything into being. What it posits instead is this notion that there are two cosmic forces. They're not even really divine. They're just natural forces, a bit like gravity in a sense. And on the uh, temple here, you have perhaps the most common, the most powerful symbols of these two great forces. And that is the dragon, the heavenly force, and the phoenix is the female, the coal, the earthly force. And they, they are locked in perpetual struggle. They try to overcome each other. And, and it's this incredible dance of power out of which all life pours. So what's humanity's role in all of this? We're fundamental to this. You've got these two great cosmic forces, and our role is to keep the balance. And we do this through ritual. And that's what this kind of temple complex was built for. This is where the ruler would come to make offerings to rebalance these two forces. And it wasn't just for the rulers. It took place in every single temple, every local shrine, right down to the household. Sounds like a potent and a pervasive worldview that Confucius is being brought up with. Absolutely, it's the only worldview he knows. As he reached adulthood, it looked as though Confucius grew to appreciate the gaping disparity between the ancient ideal of order and the reality of life subject to the chaos that raged all around him. His search for a solution to that intractable problem at the very heart of Chinese society would prove to be his life's work. Fortunately, conditions across the ancient world were nourishing new ways of thinking. Improvements in agriculture, 
increased trade and growing urbanisation meant that some in society were less tied to a life of subsistence, creating the opportunity for men like Socrates, the Buddha and Confucius to develop their ideas. The scale of change, economic and technological, is reflected in archaeological remains, like this monumental grain store. Advances in technology from the Iron Age onwards led to an increase in agricultural yields that were stored in massive pits like this. Suddenly, for ordinary people, because they had enough food, life just wasn't a grinding cycle of a kind of hand-to-mouth existence. Obviously, stores like this provided grain, but they also gave another great gift, time to think. When Confucius was about 20, we're told he landed a bureaucratic job, managing grain stores like this. But his mind was occupied by the turmoil of the day. Looking around him, it seemed obvious to Confucius that humanity needed help. And how he responded is considered a first in Chinese history. He began to engage in systematic philosophical inquiry. One thing I like about Confucius is the sense that you get that he had a kind of natural curiosity that he felt compelled to explore and to try to understand the world. And in his early 20s, he decided to leave his home state of Lu and get on the road. Travelling west, he would have eventually met the Great Yellow River. I think we have to imagine him at this point in his life as a kind of ethnographer, going from one place to another with open eyes and an open mind, gathering together experiences and encounters. The Analects describe Confucius meeting people who'd renounced civilised society and lived amongst nature. These recluses were the forerunners of Taoism, that other great belief system of ancient China. They believed in something known as the way. Could you explain to me what exactly the way is? Uh, Tao, ta Hua Sung is it possible for humans to influence or, or control the way? Uh, the Taoists believed that developed society diverted us from the way. Society was artificial something people imposed on the natural, spontaneous way of the universe. Only by reconnecting with the forces of nature could we achieve harmony once again. Confucius reacted to Taoist belief with a kind of frustrated indignation. We can't go and live with the birds and the beasts. Am I not a man among men? If the way prevailed in the world, there'd be no need for me to change it. Confucius's search for solutions to the problems of his day took on a more practical, political dimension. For him, the way wasn't an intangible cosmic force. Instead, he saw it as the harmony that could be brought about by a perfectly ordered society, something attainable by human action. It was a claim the Taoists thought the height of arrogance. This critical dispute is embodied in one legendary encounter. Confucius is said to have come here, the city of Luoyang. As he was studying in the state archives, he met an older man, 
and they struck up a philosophical discussion. As Confucius got up to leave, the old man chastised him. Put away your proud air and many desires, your insinuating habit and wild will. These are of no advantage to you. The enigmatic old man was none other than Lao Tzu, credited as the founder of Taoism. Whether it's true or not, this pairing with such a great figure reveals the iconic status Confucius would later reach. And it tells us something else. That setting in the archive gives us a clue to Confucius's methods. For him, solutions to contemporary problems lay in a close study of what had gone before. The past was a kind of reservoir of truth. Ever since he was a boy, he'd been schooled in ancient texts. Now, as a man, they became the inspiration for and the very foundation of his philosophy. Recent discoveries have shed new light on these classic texts of Chinese history. 800 bamboo slips, which contain the earliest evidence of Confucius's words. They were found in 1993 in the tomb of an old nobleman. Amazing. Yes. And, and they date back to when? Oh, they, these were dated to um, the 4th century BCE, um, roughly 100 years after Confucius. Yeah. And um, it says something like, set your mind on the way and be virtuous. Do everything in accordance with humanity. Not only the earliest words of Confucius, but beautiful words too. Wow. And they were so amazing because they provide us new information on uh, early classics that were very important to Confucius himself. And um, for example, this particular slip mentioned about the classics he would have read. Ah. Uh, the Book of Oaths, Ritual and Music. But the Book of History is very important because it recorded figures such as the Duke of Zhou uh, and early kings of the Western Zhou uh, that was about 500 years before Confucius' time. And these men were able to lead a society of harmony. Confucius found in the words of the Book of History what he was looking for. An ideal model where social and political harmony had prevailed, engineered by the almost superhumanly sage rulers of the early Zhou dynasty. In particular, the Duke of Zhou. When his brother, King Wu, died, the Duke could have seized the throne. But it's reported that instead he acted loyally, ruling as a regent for his nephew, the king's son. And then, when the boy grew up, fairly and faithfully, he handed over the reins of power. Whether these accounts were entirely true is a moot point. But Confucius saw huge potential in them. This golden age was robust evidence that social order was possible. By following the practices and the examples of the early Zhou, by reviving the past, there could be solutions to the problems of the present. It is the great thing about golden ages. They're very comforting. We believe that if humanity was capable of wonderful things in the past, we can achieve them once again. Confucius believed that early Zhou society was the ideal manifestation of his concept of the way. To recreate that harmony, society needed to return to their high standards, especially in terms of ritual. Confucius was convinced that the ancient rites had been corrupted. In order to restore the golden age, he would have to reinstate proper ritual.
Here, in Confucius's hometown of Chufu, is a temple dedicated to the master. It's the ultimate place of pilgrimage for many of his devotees. Mr. Kong traces his ancestry back to Confucius and often leads rituals that his illustrious relatives set such store by. Zhuo But ritual here has always meant more than just ceremony. It's an all-encompassing ethos that shapes every aspect of people's behaviour, including what we might call etiquette and customs. Uh, 我们的握手握两下，如果是hello，hello，hello，hello，good，hello，yeah，good，yeah，在所有的公共场合的时候呢，我们每个人要有礼节、礼貌，要懂得社会的公德，我们不要去妨碍别人的利益和去给别人带来
by saying that it, it means that it's important for us to develop this kind of reference and the proper relationship while they're still alive. As he said in the analex very clearly that if you don't know how to serve the living, how would you know how to serve the dead? That's really interesting. He's saying actually focus first on the here and now, on, on, on those who are still around you in the day to day, before you start to, to think about those who are long dead. You were so right. It's no longer just about objects like this. It's about your state of mind, your feelings, your love and sincerity from inside that you would have towards these people around you. Confucius realised that ritual brought out positive emotions in us. But his really big revelation was that this could permanently change who we are. Habitually performing the rituals of history with the right attitude and sincerity could transform our mindset. Virtuous feelings could make virtuous beings. Ritual, for him, was not just the, the way you do things uh, exactly follow the traditional and, uh, this, and the rules, but uh, even more importantly, and, uh, you got to have something inside. You got to have reverence, respect, because this uh, was the way to cultivate uh, your inside goodness, inside these kind of and qualities, and the whole person would be transformed down inside. I mean, that sounds really radical. So he's saying you, you need to do things properly, but they're not just a mechanical action. It affects who you are inside, sort of psychologically. Yes, yes, I think exactly. Not only just you know, bring order to this social and life, but also this uh, to create a new psychological and uh, this meaning there, and uh, try to cultivate uh, these uh, good human qualities. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because he doesn't sell himself as an innovator, but he was. Yes, he was. I think Confucius said, you know, he was the only transmitter. They transmitted uh, the and uh, all ancient culture to today to the future. But actually, what he did was innovation. These new things really coming from his reinterpretation of something already exists, such as the ritual. Nourishing virtue lay at the core of Confucius's vision. And he saw transformative opportunities in everyday rituals, how we speak, how we dress, and how we eat. But one that was particularly close to his heart was music. He said to have played the zither and the sounding chimes. This was a time and place where music was all around, played on totally wonderful things like this monumental set of bells that dates to just after Confucius' death. Music was played to accompany ritual in temples and homes. So if you listen to these, then you'll be hearing the sounds would have surrounded Confucius during his lifetime. Confucius was convinced that music had the power to harmonize, to transform and perfect an individual. Basically, this is art as therapy, two and a half thousand years before we invent the phrase. This practical application of philosophical ideas in day-to-day -day life is something that really marks out Confucius, as well as those other game-changing philosophers, the Buddha and Socrates. As a philosopher, you don't just indulge in abstract musings, you develop a robust delivery mechanism for your theories. Ideas have to have traction, and they have to have tangible impact. Confucius was a practical man. He'd been spurred into action by the bellicose times into which he was born. His philosophy would only truly be a success if he could affect change on a grand scale. Confucius came to think this. 
that shaping and cultivating moral individuals was the key to creating a stable social and political order. By figuring out what made a good person, you could make a good society. And so his mission was this, to teach people how to be virtuous in a world of political disorder and moral decay. Confucius had given himself a mountain to climb. How to instill virtue in society when society's moral contract was so broken was Confucius's big challenge. He was to find inspiration from a familiar and enduring institution. The family. Wow, that was quite some welcome. Thank you, Shishi. <laughs> Confucius noted how families are organized along hierarchical lines with fixed responsibilities. From birth, we learn our place within key relationships. Husband, wife, father, son, older brother, younger brother. <laughs> Recognizing, oh, thanks. Oh, yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> Recognising your... Oh, okay. Recognising your place within these relationships and fulfilling your mutual responsibilities within that hierarchy towards essential moral values. From the family, we developed a sense of loyalty, of honesty, of duty, of respect, of filial responsibility. Basically, to love those around us. Confucius saw that the concept of family was a potent model and a potential solution for society's ills. The family showed how authority could be both exercised and submitted to fairly and productively, not through intimidation, but through mutual assent. <laughs> The moral values learnt in the family, affection and care directed downwards and loyalty and obedience directed above, had the potential to transform everyone. But Confucius saw that arguably their greatest value lay in relation to the glaring problem at the heart of society, the waywardness of its rulers. This magnificent sword embodies what, for Confucius, was the fundamental problem with Chinese leadership. This was made when Confucius was alive, and it tells us all about itself. There's an inscription here that reads, belonging to King Gu Zien of Yue, made for his personal use. Now, this is obviously a fabulously deluxe object, and Confucius wouldn't have had a problem with that per se, he wasn't puritanical. He enjoyed the good things of life, swimming in rivers, singing with friends, and, and he understood the need for worldly goods. But he did not think that good men should devote their time and energy to the pursuit of personal gain. And he didn't believe in immoderate action, anywhere, anytime, from anyone. In Confucius's opinion, kings who commissioned swords like this often abandoned virtue if it got in the way of worldly success. He saw the way to transform society was to instill the values at work in the family in the rulers of his day. To understand the power they wielded, you only need to look at the way they were honored in death. This ruler, from around the time of Confucius, was buried along with 26 expensive chariots and 70 sacrificial horses. What kind of connection did Confucius see between the relationships that he'd observed between father and son in the family and, and what's going on here? Well, he, he looked at the fact that if you had a good father, 
he could bring up a good son. And a good son could then respect the father and, and th this could work. So he said, well, look, if it works at this level, let's just take it to the top. If the ruler views those beneath him as his children and treats them with love, but with firmness, with compassion, but with integrity, that it would then kind of roll down through the system and, and the Confucianist could say, look, you see how the ruler's living like this. You should live like this. And literally, it, it, would, it would roll down like, like the clouds from the mountain and bring blessing to everyone. So for him, might in and of itself wasn't a problem. But if you had might, then you also had to have a kind of philosophical responsibility to your people. Yes. Confucius continued the Zhou tradition that a ruler has the right to rule because heaven has clearly given them the power and the authority. And that's why the top, top ruler was called the son of heaven. However, that mandate, that right to rule, can be taken away by heaven. And a sign that heaven has taken it away is natural disasters, massive earthquakes, floods. Confucius said, if a ruler becomes corrupt and people are suffering through this cruelty, then the people have the right to rebel. And so Confucius, at one level, tells you respect, honor, duty, loyalty. And he also said, and if that fails, you have the right to overthrow. Amazing trick. Confucius' tactic was very direct. He set out to influence those in power by getting a governmental post. One snag was his personality. He was often seen as arrogant, too blunt in the way he delivered his advice. But he also faced a bigger problem. With enemy armies numbering as many as 300,000 camped on their borders, disloyal sons plotting behind their backs. Perhaps it's no surprise that the rulers of the day failed to take Confucius seriously. Cultivating moral character and virtuous actions in such precarious times was just not a priority. <laughs> With rejection upon rejection, Confucius's faltering political career looked set to fail, and his ideas in danger of being lost to history. But he was tenacious and resourceful. In his early 50s, it looks as though he decided to change his strategy. He gathered together a few belongings and hit the road once again to continue his moral crusade. Only this time, he wasn't alone. He was traveling together with a group of devoted students. His ability to attract motivated young men put his mission to transform self and society back on track. By all accounts, Confucius possessed a kind of compelling raw charisma. Now, combine that with intellectual rigor with bold, exciting new ideas and inspiring moral instruction, and you've got a potent mix. Whilst Confucius had failed alone, a band of around 70 students could infiltrate the corridors of power at many levels and in many states. They could be a moral vanguard to advise and instruct rulers on how to rule virtuously. And for this vital role, Confucius was scrupulously meritocratic, accepting students even from the poorest of backgrounds. In the Analects, Confucius said, I have never refused instruction to anyone if, of his own accord, he comes to me. This in itself was a truly innovatory moment, marking an historic shift. He was urging that Chinese society should no longer be governed by a hereditary elite, people who owed their positions simply to their bloodlines. Rather, it was those who were most virtuous, most concerned about the well-being of others who should lead. His way was open to people from any background 
to rise to positions of authority. Confucius shared his groundbreaking commitment to a kind of egalitarianism with Socrates and the Buddha. Their solutions were, in theory, available to everyone. But to a greater or lesser extent, when it came to women, they all seemed to have struggled. Um, none of them were exactly model family men. The Buddha left his wife and child. Socrates treated his young wife pretty cursorily. But at least those two included women in their thinking and suggested they could be part of a solution to society's problems. However, when it comes to Confucius, it seems that he had next to no time for the female of the species. The ultimate goal for Confucius's students was to become a Junza. Now, this wasn't a title he'd made up. Just as with ritual, he took something traditional and gave it a potent new twist. Junza was an aristocratic word, meaning a son of the Lord, denoting qualities that could only belong to a privileged social elite. Now, as part of his shift towards a moral elite, Confucius appropriated it and changed it to mean the ultimate moral person, a superior, a new kind of gentleman in its most literal sense. For Confucius, education was crucial. Drawing on his own life experience, he saw an unswerving commitment to critical learning as the path to self-cultivation. He likened the process to polishing jade, crafting one's virtuous character to become the perfect moral person. You had to know the books of history to live by the example of the sage kings and to enact correct ritual. But what was essential was to be morally alive to your environment, to understand how to behave intuitively in any situation, to think for yourself. Confucius's students joined their master, moving across war-torn China to try to influence its errant rulers. They were attacked, beaten, and almost starved. But these testing times sharpened their education. The challenges they faced forced them to engage in urgent moral debate. They proposed solutions to their problems and then interrogated those provoking the intense intellectual discussions between master and students that you find in the Analects. They ask questions like, should the Jinza accept office in degenerate times? Can you serve a corrupt master if you think you can make a difference? Confucius encouraged this open-ended, free-thinking discussion. Yet his students still look to him for definitive answers. Ultimately, they wanted to know what was the essence of goodness. For Confucius, there was one all-embracing virtue, the most essential to cultivate, and yet the most difficult to attain. Something called Ren. Ren is a very splendid yes. word idea, but mm -hmm. what does it actually mean? What, what quality does mm -hmm. it imply? Uh, many people try to translate it differently. It's been translated as human heartedness, as good or goodness. But uh, we prefer now to use the word simply humanity because uh, virtually all Confucian values are, are linked to this notion. Courage uh, with Ren, then it's real courage rather than just simply bravery. Justice with Ren, then it's a humane justice rather than just harsh punishment, wisdom with Ren, then uh, it's being wise, not just being smart. And is this something that you achieve, or is looking for Ren a constant quest? Every person, by definition of being a person, embodies Ren. In other words, every human being is capable of sympathetic response to uh, the external world. But at the same time, to realize Ren fully which means human flourishing 
in the most uh, comprehensive sense of the term. That requires learning. Uh, learning, of course, it's not simply the acquisition of knowledge or internalization of skills, but basically learning to build one's character. And in that sense, it's like the highest ideal. At the same time, it's the minimum requirement to be human. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you think that Confucius felt that he'd achieved Ren? Mm -hmm. No. And the interesting thing is that uh, many students or followers of Confucius also said, no, Ren requires continuous process of struggling. Even to the end of your life, this is uh, still a task, incomplete. So no matter what, the struggle to be fully human continues. There's something in Confucian philosophy, a core message, that I find really genuinely inspiring. It's his golden rule taken from the Analects. One student said, is there a single word that I should use as a rule to live my life by? And the master replied, that would be empathy, perhaps. What you do not wish for yourself, don't do to others. It's this focus on human relations and being compassionate that I think comes closest to defining what Confucius meant by the term Ren. I do love this about all three of the philosophers whose stories I'm investigating. They made it clear that none of us operate in isolation. It isn't that man is the measure of all things, but man's relationship with man. Confucius continued to travel and to teach into his later years, but only a handful of his students went on to hold political office. When Confucius was 73, he fell ill. Unable to fulfill his mission, his final words seemed defeated and bitterly disappointed. No intelligent monarch arises. There is none who will make me his master. It is my time to die. Confucius was buried here in his hometown, Chufu. The great transformation he'd worked for his entire life had not been fulfilled. But his devoted students planted trees around his grave and kept his dream alive. For 300 years, Confucius's ideas continued as just one of many Chinese schools of thought. Competing with the likes of Taoism, it was unable to affect real change in a chaotic world. But once China was reunited under all powerful emperors, stability changed the political landscape. The first emperor of the Han Dynasty was convinced by his principal advisor that ruling by brutality had served his predecessor badly. Allying himself with Confucianism and its ideal of rule by virtue would lend his dynasty greater legitimacy. Many of the values that Confucius set great store by, the importance of education, a shared cultural heritage, and ethical government, had seemed an irrelevance during the chaos of his lifetime. But these would prove hugely effective in holding the new empire together. Successive emperors enthusiastically took up Confucian ideas, and education was central. The poetry, arts and music of the early Zhou were revived as a means of cultivating the goodness and virtue within. School children learned the Confucian canon by heart, meticulously writing it out in their best calligraphy. Knowledge of the books of history and rituals of the Zhou dynasty 
became a prerequisite to be part of the civil service. Confucian education and Confucian texts became a powerfully integrative force in Chinese history. And of course, it was very useful for rulers to have all that emphasis on obedience and respect and top-down structure. Even those who didn't get the chance to go to school learnt his words. It's actually why we've developed that rather crass form Confucius says, because for 24 centuries, right across China, people were all quoting Confucius. Confucius say a boy, a girl, a moon Make wedding bells ring out in month of June Confucius say when love come don't delay So honey hold me tight Tonight's the night Remember what Confucius say But all that changed in the 20th century. Confucianism came under attack. In 1919, students who wanted China to modernize and become democratic condemned Confucius for holding them back. But it was Chairman Mao's cultural revolution of the 1960s that tried to annihilate all vestiges of his legacy. His Red Guard destroyed statues temples and texts. They even came here, to his burial place. In a telegram to Chairman Mao, they wrote, we have dragged out the statue of Confucius. We have torn down the plaque extolling the teacher of 10,000 generations. We have leveled Confucius's grave. We have destroyed. It is really chilling coming here to see how a raging, rigid form of an ideology tried to obliterate the memory of a man of ideas. But thousands of years of ubiquitous Confucian education, particularly the exam system, had embedded his principles deep within Chinese culture. By the start of the 21st century, the government began once again to embrace his ideals. Today, Confucianism is undergoing a renaissance and education remains at the forefront. This is a Confucian school in Chufu. 120 pupils from the ages of 6 to 18 study the Confucian texts and classical arts here. It's just one of around 3,000 schools in China that teaches Confucian values and philosophy. <laughs> So what is your favorite Confucius quote? Why do you like Confucius? Why did you decide to send your daughter to a Confucian school? It's just fascinating seeing these kids being brought up with an ancient philosophy at the heart of everything that they think and say and do. And actually, they seem to be having a great time. It's also even more incredible, though, if you think that just a few decades ago, Confucius was considered an enemy of the state, and none of this would have been allowed to happen, or if it did, it would have had to have happened in secret, behind closed doors, and at the risk of really severe punishment. In modern China, 
Greater individualism is seen to have undermined a collective sense of right and wrong. Confucius's resurgence can be explained by the desire for a clearer sense of moral purpose. But I wonder if Confucius's appeal is very simple. He tells us that whatever our character, whatever situation we're born into, being good, living a good life is a possibility and that the route to goodness is wisdom. Now, that means that as a species, in our finest form, we are all philosophers, in the true sense of the word, lovers of wisdom. Across this series, I've examined the ideas of three inspiring minds of the ancient world. Socrates brought philosophy down from the heavens and into people's homes so that through the training of our reason, we can achieve happiness for ourselves. But then came the question from, is there God? To questions like how to agree on good action without necessarily agreeing on what happened after death. Confucius said, you know, ritual is a way to bring out the inside good qualities, like the benevolence, like this reverence. And if more people possess these good qualities and become a real human, then the social life, family life, or community life would become peaceful. But ultimately, what do they have to teach us in the here and now? Although these were ideas that were developed 25 centuries ago, yes. do you think they have as much relevance to our world mm -hmm. as they did to ancient China, ancient Greece, ancient India? If I want to exaggerate, probably even more so. They were confronted with a world in disintegration, a little rationality, a little compassion. And we are in a world that's much more serious because uh, it's not simply the human world is in trouble, the planet is in trouble. And uh, we have in our power the destruction of all civilizations, including the planet itself. So a change has to be made, not just uh, the change of a political system or economic system. Uh, these are absolutely necessary, but a change of a mindset and the retrieval of the wisdom of uh, Socrates, the Buddha, and Confucius. It's not a question of relevance, it's a question of human survival. These extraordinary thinkers aren't remote historical figures. They are pioneers of human consciousness, whose ideas have informed and enriched the lives of countless people to this day. Their radical responses to the social upheaval of their age have in many ways determined who we are now. Their message was inspiring and challenging, that the world isn't unknowable, unchangeable. By engaging with it fully, we can lead better and more meaningful lives. We have agency. Our minds can shape the world. If the mind of Confucius has made you think, then explore further with the Open University to discover how great minds have influenced our world today. Go to the address on the screen and follow the links to the Open University. Mm -hmm.